Welcome to Theory of Pets. I'm a passionate pet owner with a drive to help others like me uncover the truth about the pet industry and what goes on behind the scenes. Pet sitters can solve a wide array of problems. Some people have dogs who, for one reason or another, cannot go to a boarding facility or a doggy daycare. Some people travel and their dogs have severe anxiety and it's easier to have a pet sitter come to their house and watch them. Pet sitters can watch your home, water your plants, get your mail, obviously take care of your pet. Um, they can come for the day to spend time with your dog, give any medication that might be necessary. There is a wide range of things that pet sitters will do, but finding the right pet sitter for you and your needs can be a challenge. Today I had the pleasure of speaking with Laura Vorrier, and she is the author of The Pet Sitter's Tale. She's an entrepreneur who uh, pioneered the dog walking industry in Hollywood more than 15 years ago and has now built a large business of pet sitting in that area. So she's here to share some firsthand information about her uh, pet sitting business, how it got started, and how it's grown. Um, she even has some interesting information about some of the celebrities that she has had the pleasure of working with. Good morning, Samantha. My name is Laura, and my last name is Warrior. It's like Warrior with a V. A lot of people look at my name and say, how do you say that? So just right off the bat, I'll say it's like <laughs> Warrior with a V, Warrior. And I am the author of a book called The Pet Sitter's Tale, and I'm the owner of a company out in Los Angeles called Your Dog's Best Friend, and we do pet sitting and dog walking, basic obedience training, overnight stays in our clients' homes, and we do... Um, boarding in our private facility and anything really ancillary that clients need trips to vets trips to groomers and um, you know whatever we can do that we can accommodate and make the, the owner's lives easier we we absolutely do that and i hate saying owner but sometimes when i say pet parent people get confused by that so um <laughs> That, that's who I am, and that's just a little bit about what I do. And how I got started in the um, industry is kind of interesting. I am originally from Chicago. I moved out to Los Angeles to be a film and television makeup artist, and that really went terribly. And as just a way of survival, I started doing you know any other thing that I could to make extra money. And one of those things was dog walking. And I happened to be walking a dog on a lot for, a, for an actress that was working on a feature. And out of a trailer came the comedian Paula Poundstone. And I knew better than to make eye contact with a celebrity. So I was just <laughs> very much head down, focused on the dog, and kind of ignoring her. Um, but she was very interested in the dog, adorable dog. And she came over and she said, hey, are you a professional dog walker? And I just looked at Paula and I thought, oh my gosh, I can pick her and being a makeup artist and maybe she might hire me, but I know where that's going. Um, or I just, just go with the flow and just say, yeah, I'm a professional dog walker. I mean, I'm walking the dog and I'm getting paid for it. I am a professional. And so I said, uh, yeah, I, I'm a professional dog walker. And she said, great, because I have a dog and he's a real, you know what? And, <laughs> oh. There goes my dog. And so I love to hire you. And that's how it started. Wow. That's so neat. Very cool. You went out to do one thing and ended up doing something completely different. Yeah. And thank goodness because, you know, it was, you know, it was, it's, it's hard when you are on your own and you're trying to make it in a new city and you really don't know anybody. Um, and, you know, the struggle is real. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's it's funny that you ended up as a dog walker. I always tell people when they ask the best part of my job, it's it's the pet parents. It, people, pet parents are a different type of person. They, they love, you know, we all have that one thing in common. We love our animals. They're easy to talk to. It just opens up so easily. It's it's not nearly as difficult as trying to connect with people that, you know, you don't have anything in common with. So it must have been a great way for you to meet people really easily in a, a brand new place. Oh, absolutely. And and really, to your point, it is so much easier to connect with animals because, you know, I think they sense 
people's energy absolutely and you know they're not as judgmental as some people are honestly and you know I think that they give us that unconditional love and they give us that that, that you know really companionship that we're seeking especially if you're out on your own yeah for sure I actually I was just trying to think of how many friends I have now that I actually met through my animals, through our dogs, whether you meet them at a dog park or through some kind of an event that, you know, brings pet owners together. You see a dog, you go over it. Almost sometimes you, you talk to the dog first before you talk to the human, you know, so it's an easy way to meet people. Absolutely. You know, that is so true. My dog has a little, I call it his little girlfriend, but you know, <laughs> I, I probably would have spoken to the people, but my Dexter was so interested in the dog Dylan and we got to talking and now we're friends. I think that happens a lot where your dog kind of knows that like these, these people are cool. Let's go hang on. I like that dog. You're going to like the people. It seems that, you know, it, it never doesn't work out like that. Like your dog has good taste like you do. <laughs> Absolutely. So you work, um, obviously, in one of the, what I would call the coolest places in our country. You work in LA. So you must work for some celebrity clients. Uh, yeah, you know, you just can't have a business out here where you don't have a celebrity. Um, it's rare because there are so many here. A lot of them live here, if not all the time, at least part time. So if you have any kind of business at all that, you know, offers a service or even a product based service, um, you, you will just by the very, you know, the fact that you stay in business for a while, you'll, you'll get a celebrity. You know, I'm not saying you'll get, you know, uh, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, but, you know, you'll definitely <laughs> get one or two of them for sure. It just happens. And I always tell people, they're like, oh, you know, how will I know? And I'll say, you'll know because an assistant will call or, or oh. like an estate manager will call. You know, it's usually not them themselves who call you up and say, I'm so-and-so, but it's like someone will be very discreet. Like, I'm calling for my boss. And then you're like, oh. Oh. <laughs> Super interested now. <laughs> <laughs> so when you work with celebrities, do you get interesting requests? You know, sometimes I do, but most of the time, you know, they're just like our request, but they're taken up a notch, you know. So if I would have to get a dog to a groomer or get a dog, let's say, to a vet, you know, the dog is being transported in, you know, a really nice vehicle or maybe going somewhere on a private plane um, or, you know, it's getting this is this is the um, this is, has been a trend that I've seen is chef prepared food for pets. So oh. you know how some of us might make like we might make um, food at home for our dogs. Well, celebrities are having their chefs prepare prepare the food at home for dogs or for cats for that matter. So it's everything we're doing except better, Samantha. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, that's that's kind of what I expected. That of course if they are taking better care of themselves and able to afford better things for themselves, of course they're gonna do the same thing for their pets. Yeah, why wouldn't they? I mean okay. it's just it seems natural. Of course. I mean, if I could afford to have a professional chef make my dog nutritionally balanced meals, I would do it too. Yeah, and I would eat them as well. <laughs> so, of course, all your clients are not celebrities. Most of them probably are not. Um, what would, like a typical, if somebody calls you and they need a pet sitter, um, what would that entail usually? So, um, there's, you know, a couple different services that we offer. So, um I would say the core of my business is daily dog walking and then also pet sitting, but a lot of the pet sitting I use independent contractors for people who are on my team. But pet sitting can go a couple of ways. So either somebody wants you to come and sleep at their house, so that's a 24-hour visit. So basically it would entail showing up after the client has left. I, I try not to show up before the client has left. Of course, we've already done the initial meet and greet to make sure everyone's tail is wagging, make sure it's gonna be a good fit, and that's essential. I always do that, and of course, that's complimentary. And that's for my own safety, it's for the safety of the pet, it's for the client. It's just so that I can go to the house and get a feel for, this is somewhere I wanna stay, I like this dog, this is gonna be a good fit. Because, you know, when you go on those interviews, it's your objective to make sure that it's going 
going to work for you. So it's a, it's really is sort of a two way street. So that has to happen. But once everyone's tail is wagging and we decide to move forward, what I'll typically do on that initial visit is get all the information I need. You know, just everything. Who is the best? How to reach the client? Where they're going? I always ask, where are you going? People say, oh, you're just nosy. I'm not nosy. I really want to know what the time difference is going to be because if I have to call you, I don't want to call you in the middle of the night um, and you're sleeping. So I always say, you know, where are you going? Who is an emergency contact? You know, all the information that anyone should get if they're going to be responsible for someone's house and furry, furry baby. So get all that. And then at the first visit, the client in a perfect world has already gone. I mean, I really don't like going to the house and the client is still waiting for their car to pick them up or they're still packing. It makes the dog anxious. It's really, it's pointless. It's kind of a waste of my time because I'm there for the pet not to make small talk with the owners. So typically the owner will leave and I'll show up within a two hour window when they've left. Um, and then if it's the middle of the day, we'll do, let's say, out for a walk, getting acquainted, um, just, you know, preparing for staying there and maybe bring my things in. And then usually leave to do daily dog walking or whatever other pet sitters I have, but go back for a feeding around five or six and then another walk. Now I'll either spend the night at that visit or leave again and come back in the evening time when I'm going to sleep and then wake up in the morning. There's a built-in visit, so dog's out having breakfast, getting a walk, all that good stuff, and then leave, you know, dog walking again, but then back for a midday visit. So um, when you're doing overnights, it does entail a lot of visits. So there's at least three built-in visits. So when you wake up, when you go to bed, and when you come back. And most clients are pretty happy with that because, you know, you could wind up staying for hours if you're kind of moving into someone's home and taking over the responsibilities that they would do if they were actually there. So that's an overnight stay, and then if you're just doing pet sitting but there's no sleeping over, it's kind of the same thing. Um, go there, take the dog out, offer a walk. Um, if it gets very hot, some people just say, you know, don't walk them, it's too hot, just let them in the yard. So some time in the yard, you know, get your yayas out, do treating, maybe work on commands if they're working on commands, just hanging with the pet, making sure they're comfortable, making sure they're not lonely, making sure they're not tearing things up because they're having separation anxiety. And also, you know, it's really important to do the ancillary things in the house. Um, so packages aren't piling up, um, the garage door didn't open up, the pool didn't flood. Um, you know, all of these things that can also happen in someone's home when they're away. So also being the eyes and ears of the homeowner while they're away. That's definitely, I mean, those are all great things. Obviously, some people will need those. Not everybody um, will be able to afford to have somebody come into their home and do those things. So if you, let's say somebody's listening and they're, they're thinking, I just, I would love to have somebody come over, walk my dog, burn some of that energy so he's not alone all day, but I can't afford that. Do you have any tips for those people? Absolutely. I, I, I so do. So my, my, one of my core beliefs is where there's a will, there's a way. So listen, you can't underestimate the desire for someone to spend time with the dog if they don't have one. <laughs> so I know a lot of people that live in apartments and they work with me and they're like, oh my gosh, I just, I, I can't have a dog. It doesn't fit my lifestyle or my home right now, but I really miss spending time. Um, can I walk dogs? I, I do it for nothing. I do it just for the sheer pleasure of it. So, honestly, I think there's a way to find someone that will do it um, in exchange for something else. People are constantly doing trades and bartering. So, if you have something that you can offer, like, hey, I'll babysit your kids on the weekends or whatever works for you if you can look after my dog. So, also, vet techs and, and vet tech students and students, you know, there are so many ways to have your dog visited without paying, you know, the price of a professional pet sitter or an on-demand app, Dog Walker. Um, just look for it. You know, I, I use an app called Nextdoor, and it's just all my neighbors who are interested in being on the app. We all can talk to each other. Oh, what's going on in the neighborhood? Oh, well, the other night there was a coyote kind of like cruising in the street, and they were like, hey, you know, Coyotes out, so make sure your pets are in. Um, and it's just a kind of a real good neighborhood watch. That's all online. So just look around. Um, it's tougher for people who are in rural areas because it's more difficult to get access to your neighbors and your neighbors are far away. But again, your veterinarian is a great resource and really any kind of 
student or college or even high school kid that might be interested in some extra credit or volunteer opportunities, I, I just say really look because in, in this life I find, you know, if you do look, you, you will find what you're looking for. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I live um, in Maine. We're in a rural area and we actually know quite a few people who, um, like you say, they kind of barter favors. You know, somebody lets somebody's dog out and somebody watches the kids or whatever. So it's definitely out there, um, I think. But let's say that somebody is considering a pet sitter because maybe, you know, they they um, are looking for a professional. Their dog maybe needs um medication or something that's, you know, they really want to trust somebody professional with, um, what would your advice be when looking for a pet sitter? What are some of the things people should look for? Well, the first thing is passion. You know, absolutely. That, that person has to come to your house and they have to greet your pet and they have to be passionate about your pet. Yeah, I mean, trust your instincts. I mean, absolutely. If somebody comes to your house, your dog's growling, they've got their tail tucked, you know, they're hiding. Um, that kind of gives you an idea that maybe your dog isn't comfortable with that person. It doesn't mean something's wrong with that person. It just means your dog's not feeling it with that person. So your dog should be really really happy to see that person because most pet sitters um, are really pet people and pets get it. Like, they know. They absolutely should be excited. They they can smell a dog walker a mile away, you know? Um, so you should look for the reaction from your pet, but also get references. It is so important. It's, it's especially important when somebody is starting out in the beginning and they tell you, hey, I'm just starting. You might be one of my first clients. That's fine, but you should be able to get at least three references from somebody who says, oh, you know, they're my neighbor, they're my roommate, they worked for me, because you really want to be able to do your due diligence. I mean, after all, this is your furry baby, um, this is someone that you love, this is your home. Um, so get references, um, and also ask them if you can pay them for them to do a visit while you're there. I mean, there's nothing better than seeing, you know, seeing them get that harness on. That's so important. You know, I've had so many experiences where I hired independent contractors and it's you know gone really great until they get like a tricky harness thing and or they call me up and they're like oh my gosh they have a dental leader and well, how do I get it on or what do I do and you hear these you know really sad stories where you've gotten somebody who doesn't listen to the client's instructions and they're like oh you know always put the halter on they can slip out of their collar and they can't figure out the halter or they're don't think it's important or they're just lazy, whatever the case, and they take the, the dog out and sure enough, the dog gets scared, backs out of the collar, and now it's missing. So you really want to make sure that you trust somebody, that the lines of communication are going to be open, and that you feel absolutely comfortable with them, and your pet does as well. Those are fantastic tips, and I know, you know, for people, especially people living in urban areas, there may be multiple pet sitters in their area. So it's good to know the things to look for because obviously, you know, you're going to have to make that decision and you want to make the best one for your dog. Yes, absolutely. For your dog and yourself, but ultimately for your dog, you know, and I have, I've been in this long enough where I have seen it go wrong so many ways. And one of the ways it can go wrong is you have to be communicating as a pet sitter with your client and you should be proactive. You know, I never have had a client say, don't text me or don't call me. Never, because we're all on our phones. We're all texting all the time. So if somebody goes on vacation and when they land, the first thing they do is look at their phone and want to see a picture of their pooch and they have you know no word from their pet sitter silence it starts to make them nervous I've actually had had clients before they came on board with your dog's best friend who were like yeah we were on vacation and we couldn't get a hold of our pet sitter and we wound up flying back home and our pet sitter was just sitting on the couch chilling had been there but just decided oh I'm here at the clients I'm just gonna chill and turn my phone off and relax and the client was going crazy trying to reach her. Is the dog okay? Like, they just oh, missed no. silence for something being wrong. It, you know, there's so many ways that this can go badly. And it is really based on trust and communication. So as a professional pet sitter, I say to anybody who is an aspiring pr professional pet sitter or just a pet sitter, um, just casually doing it, I, just make sure to communicate with your clients because that's how you're going to get recommended to those friends and family. And that's how you build a business. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. Communication is definitely key. We've been in that situation before, like you discussed where, you know, the silence and you take it obviously to mean something isn't going right, right? If everything was going well and they were happy and having a good time when they send you a picture of your dog, you know, out playing fetch or going for a walk or something like that. So um, it's important. I mean, our pets are our family. Think about, you know, if somebody was entrusting you with their child, would you never update them and just hope that they assumed that their kid was doing okay? No, of course you would let them know, you know, throughout the day what they were doing and how things were going. Absolutely. Right. It's just like a kid. Absolutely. And I think it's even to some people. I mean, a lot of my clients don't have human kids. I think they worry about their furry children a little bit more because, you know, they can't vocalize if something happened. They can't really call you up and, you know, go in the other room or, or message you and be like, help, <laughs> you know, so you're, you're really entrusting them 100%. You know, again, it's very important. Can't underestimate the value of this service. And, you know, you can't put a price tag on somebody's peace of mind. You really can't. Oh, absolutely. I, I agree. Peace of mind for sure is worth way more than what most people pay for pet sitters. That's that's for sure. Um, you wrote, you, you touched on it just a little bit, um, The Pet Sitter's Tale. So tell us a little bit about the book and how it came to be. Sure. Um, so the book is a collection of short stories, actually things that happened to me when I first came out to L.A. and kind of landed in pet sitting and dog walking. It's how I started. Um, some of the crazy situations, too. And um, one of the reasons I wrote it is because I had never imagined that I would become a professional pet sitter. I'm actually um, from the corporate world before I was a makeup artist, so I was in corporate sales for most of my career and had a very different day-to-day -day, um, lifestyle. So get up in the morning, put on that power suit, go in the office, make calls, set up appointments, take clients to lunch, go on business trips, attend conferences. You know, um, very different than... I mean, really different than, you know, wearing, you know, athletic wear all day and hanging out with dogs and having poop <laughs> bags in every pocket. So I kind of wrote the book because a lot of my friends who were back in Chicago, who were still at the corporate jobs and climbing the corporate ladder, they were like, so you just watch dogs all day? Like, what does that look like? <laughs> and you make money um, at that? So how do you do it? You know, I, I think that, you know, people didn't, understand that it was a profession so I was really at the right place and right time when it was really turning into an industry even before it was on demand and app based um, you know people were interested in it and it was like a new industry it was sort of like in the gray area of what was accepted as a professional and people are, are still interested in it now it, it seems at least in California it's a very mainstream and there's a lot of pet sitters and dog walkers out here, a lot. Um, but still, I noticed some of them are doing it as like, you know, one of the many menu of services that they offer. You know, so, oh, I'll babysit, oh, I'll pet sit, or oh, I'll, you know, um, teach your kid piano, or, you know, whatever. So it's a very much the gig economy. But um, a lot of people do do it and just as their sole source of income, and it's so rewarding. So um, that's how it all started. That's why I wrote the book. And the book has a great story in every chapter, just from the very beginning of getting started and also growing the business and the dogs. Every chapter starts with a client that I actually had and just a little, you know, about that dog and how much I love them and how you come to think of all the dogs as your own dog. It's, it's, it's really is a, quite a phenomenon. That's amazing. That is really cool. And what better thing to write about than something that you love and you're passionate about? Right? It's so true. I mean, I, I mean, you have to write what you know. I mean, there's nothing else you can write. Um, and that was the interesting thing about being a writer and writing my first book is when I was a kid, I always wanted to be a writer, but I, I really wasn't inspired to write anything. I always felt like, well, I have nothing, there's no good story here. There's nothing. But when I came out to LA, it was sort of like an epiphany after I had sort of, you know, 
discovered this industry and sort of forged my way in the in the business and it really started get going I thought wow you know I, I have a story now this is kind of interesting because it was new to me and I thought well it must be new to so many people too it, it, it's, it's so it's so interesting what happens outside of your own vision of your your own life you know that other people have these interesting careers and and you're like it's it's really otherworldly and quite an eye-opener for sure. And because we're doing a recorded podcast, um, I wanted to mention that you recorded an audiobook version of The Pet Sitter's Tale. Is that available yet? Yes, it's available. It just came out. Uh, thanks for asking about that. So the Audible book just came out. You can you can get on iTunes, on Audible, or Amazon, and it's narrated by yours truly. Um, and that was uh, fun, uh, exhausting, and uh, uh, terrifying, terrifying. Um, <laughs> I sort of vacillated between, you know, uh, hiring somebody or doing it myself. I, I wanted to hire somebody, but then I wasn't sure that... Um, they were going to do justice to the material because some of the material is very heartfelt, you know, talking about the dogs and my own dog, Dexter, and my personal life story. Um, I just wanted to give it a crack, so I did that. Um, it's about four hours, which is, you know, not too long, um, considering you get some books and, you know, they're days. Um, so it's interesting if you walking your dog or you're commuting or taking the kids to school, it is a really fun book to listen to. And I think, um, I think, you know, people will like it. I'm getting really good feedback on the audiobook. That's awesome. And congratulations on that. That's really fantastic. Um, there will be a link to for any of our listeners that are interested in checking out either the book in its um, written form or audio form. We'll have links to both of those below the podcast so you can check those out. Laura, is there anything else that you want to leave our listeners with before we go today? Oh my gosh. Um, just thank you to everyone out there that has read the book, that connects with me on Twitter or Facebook. I love that. And also, I encourage people so much, Samantha, as I'm sure you do too, to adopt, don't shop. There are so many viable pets and great, very good dogs out there in shelters and rescues waiting for a second chance, waiting for an opportunity to be in a loving home. Um, just open up your heart and open up the doors to your home and give give those pets a chance because I, I really feel strongly about adoption and I would love to see more people adopting pets. Absolutely. Anybody that follows my podcasts or my articles on Top Dog Tips, um, first of all, I have to, this is a little disclaimer. We live out in the country. We have acres and acres of land for our animals, um, but we do currently have three rescue dogs and six rescue cats right now. So um, we always have animals in and out. Sometimes we rescue and we rehome. Quite often we rescue and they end up growing on us and they don't leave. <laughs> so that would be why we have three dogs and six cats right now. Um, but, you know, it, it, it is definitely, you know, there's so many animals out there that need a home. If you're looking for a guinea pig or a rat, there are homeless animals out there that need you. If you're looking for something bigger from dogs and horses, we had a rescue alpaca once, believe it or not, here. I mean, there's animals everywhere, no matter what you're looking for, that need a home. So um, that's certainly one of my soapboxes that I uh, stand on quite a lot. And um, I would highly encourage people to rescue as well. That's so awesome. And you know, I just saw the cutest video yesterday about a woman who has an alpaca and she's like, look how much my alpaca loves me. And every time she went, the alpaca was like right there and kissing her in there and <laughs> nuzzling. And it was so sweet. I'm like, oh, I know I want an alpaca. <laughs> they are super sweet animals. They are really almost like overgrown dogs. Um, we adored ours. We did not have the proper housing for um, an alpaca. We didn't have a, a barn or shed that he could stay in our fencing or we made it work in our garage um, with a little makeshift fence for the time being but uh, once he was healthy and ready to go he actually went to a farm right here um, in our hometown so we still see him sometimes um, but yeah they're, they are wonderful animals for sure maybe someday somebody will call you and ask you to pet sit their alpaca <laughs> I pet that a llama once. <laughs> you did. <laughs> you never know. That's the wonderful thing about pets. And like I said, no matter what kind of pet you're looking for, I can promise you somewhere you will find a homeless animal waiting for you. 
Oh, yeah, just at the local shelter. My friend called me. She works there, and she's like, you wouldn't believe it. Somebody abandoned a, a, a huge tortoise in the parking lot. The oh. shelter wasn't open, and even though they take mostly dogs and cats, they do take other animals, and somebody just abandoned a huge tortoise in the parking lot. When she pulled in, she's like, oh, my God, there was a there's a tortoise no. here. <laughs> she has a tortoise. <laughs> See, that would be me. That, that is my problem with ever having to work in a rescue or a shelter. I We would own a lot more animals than we already do. <laughs> I know. At some point, it gets the choice between you, the animals, and your husband. <laughs> we're we're getting there. My husband is kind of like you know. Well, I will say he started with our third cat, saying, "Okay, that's it. Seriously, we're at maximum capacity for cats." And then we got a fourth cat, and he said, "Sam, I'm serious. No more cats." I said, "Okay." And now we have our fifth, and we recently got our sixth. Actually, came to us on Thanksgiving of this past year. So, um, I he's he's not sick of it yet, but he's getting there. I know my husband's the same way. He's the same way. I mean, that's how he is about Dexter sleeping in the bed. Because at first he's like, okay, well, he can sleep on the corner, and then no, he's gotten <laughs> older, and we've been together a long time. Like Dexter's under the covers, his head's on the pillow. You know, he's like, oh my gosh, with Dexter. <laughs> it's they they work their way into your home first, and then into your heart is what I always say. If you can open your home to an animal, they will very quickly work their way into your heart. It does not take long. And there's nothing, nothing like it in this world. And I, I wouldn't change any of it for one second. Absolutely. I could not agree more. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate you being on the podcast and sharing um, your information. I'm sure there's people out there considering pet sitters or maybe even they're thinking about starting their own pet sitter business. So um, either way, checking out the book would be a great place to start. Awesome. Thank you so much. It's been great to talk to you. One more big thank you to Laura Vorrier for being here today and talking to us about her business and her book. Um, again, check out those links if you're interested in checking out her book, either in written or audio form. Um, and thank you guys for tuning in. If you have any questions, jump on our website, theoryofpets.com. You can leave your questions there. Um, and if they're for me, I will try and answer those as soon as possible. And if you have a question for Laura, you can leave it there and I will pass it along to her, of course. Um, if you guys, while you're on the site, if you could take just a quick second to leave me a review on the podcast if you uh, like it, if there's anything that you'd like to uh, see us do differently, and if there's any topics that you would like us to cover in the future, questions that you have, feel free to leave those all on there. Thanks a lot for tuning in, guys. I'll be back with another hot topic very soon.